Well, what an incredible year we've had. Possibly the most tumultuous year we've had in the past 25 or more. Truly a year for us to fall on our knees. I bet most of us are feeling a little weary this holiday season. I bet all of us have gone through a wide range of thoughts and emotions over the past six to nine months. We all have questions stirring in our minds and hearts, that's for sure. Maybe you've had questions like this. How did all this happen so fast? Why is all of this happening? Where is it all going? Where's God in all of this? Today, I want to send us into 2021 with some perspective. This perspective is nothing new since it's going to come from the scriptures. And this perspective is nothing new because since it's from the scriptures, you've likely heard it before. But this perspective is becoming more and more a reality for us as Christians today. And I hope today you will conclude that this perspective is a good thing and that you will want to have more and more of it in the new year. Now, before we get to the scriptures, let's take a trip back to the late 100s, close to 200 A.D., and if you see this picture up here, or before we, right here, this is called the, Alexa, the Alexmanas Graffito. It was found in Rome in 1857. It's anti Christian graffiti, and it's probably the oldest depiction of Christ we have, dated from around the late 100s, maybe 200 AD. It depicts Christ and his followers as, shall we say, donkeys. The Greek words are translated, Alexmanos worships his God. Now, I put this in here to start us out with a reminder that the ridicule of Christ Christians and the truth of the Bible we are experiencing today is nothing new. The key is how shall we live in the midst of it. Thankfully, the scriptures of 2,000 years ago are of some real help for us today in our new year and beyond. So if you have your word with you, Turn to Hebrews 10, 33 through 39. I'll read it. We're going to look at two passages today, Hebrews and 1 Peter. Hebrews 10, 32 through 39. Let me read it for us. But recall the former days when after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with suffering, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction and sometimes being partners with those so treated. For you had compassion on those in prison, and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property, since you knew you had, since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. For you have need of endurance." So that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. For yet a little while, and the coming one will come and will not delay. But my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls." So first, ridicule and affliction should be expected. Verses 32 through 34. Hebrews was written to Jewish Christians who were struggling with the challenges 
of living as Christians among their Jewish family, co-workers, religious community, and so forth. The writer is encouraging them not to shrink back into their old and comfortable ways, but to persevere in their newfound salvation in Christ. So, what was the hard struggle with suffering in verse 32? The picture here is one of an athletic struggle. Three things the text tells us. In verse 33, first it says, publicly exposed to reproach <clears throat> and affliction. The NASV says, public spectacle through insults and abuse. This was very likely strong public opposition, including loss of business, family being cut off from other family members, and people knowing about it. It included shame, disgrace, false accusations, mockery, and even some physical abuse. Verse 34 tells us, some were unjustly put into prison. Notice, those who were not in prison ministered to those who were. And verse 34, it goes even further and says, the plundering of their property. Now, what is that? Literally, it was the unjust seizure of goods, property, or homes. This was likely done by anti-Christian mobs, or even the government at times. Notice, the persecution they suffered was diverse, sometimes minimal and sometimes extreme. It ranged from public mockery and ridicule, being disowned by family members, unjust accusations and ac actions against them, all the way to actual unjust seizure of property. Now, we may not be experiencing some of these more extreme forms of persecution, but we are seeing a growing presence of ridicule, mockery, false accusations, and potential threats on Christians in America, aren't we? Not only this, <laughs> we are certainly seeing what were once assumed moral values float away more and more. Christian faith is being seen more and more as puritanical and oppressive. But the good news is, verse 34 through 36, our union with Christ sets a right perspective. Notice the key to the text. It is the writer reminding Christians to have the right perspective through it all. Number one, joyfully accepted property seizure because they had a better possession and an abiding one. Now, what does that mean? Who says that? Who says they joyfully accepted the plundering of their property because you had a better possession and an abiding one. Who says that? What was it? It was the knowledge that the salvation they had found in Christ alone will lead to a much better possession, assured eternal life with God. Amen. It's a comparison of the lesser to greater. It's them saying to themselves, hey, we can take this abuse because you cannot take away the greater thing we have in Christ, our eternal life. The message version of the Bible says it this way. If some enemies broke in and seized your goods, you let them go with a smile, knowing that they could not touch your real treasure. Wow. Wow. Is that perspective for the new year or what? Verse 35 says, Don't throw away your confidence, which will come with great reward. Our union with Christ sets this right perspective. Don't throw away your confidence. 
it's going to come with great reward. That is, they had great confidence in their salvation through their faith in Christ. Their confidence is not in what they have done for their eternal life, but in all of what Christ did to give them eternal life. So don't throw it away. Don't give up the faith. Don't give in. Your faith in Christ alone will come with great reward one day in heaven. Amen. This reward is certain for them and is certain for us. And then in verse 36, it says, But all of this is going to require endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what is promised. Commentator Cleon Rogers says the word endurance here literally means, this is great, the spirit endurance is the spirit that can bear things, not simply with resignation, but with blazing hope. He goes on to say that Christians can patiently bear all things because they know these things are leading to the goal of glory. Wow. And then third, perspective produces this perseverance. Verse 39, continuing this vision for endurance that's fueled by our union with Christ, the writer tells us we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but are of those who have faith and preserve our souls. We must remain loyal to our master Jesus. We must remain faithful to the gospel message we have faith in. This is one of the large roles of the Holy Spirit in our lives. He enables us to have perseverance through hardship and suffering. Having the perspective the writer encourages us with in these previous verses will certainly help us on this journey. Let's go to one more text that will further strengthen our perspective in the new year. And that's the book of 1 Peter. So we see Hebrews telling us some important things about perspective. Ironically, 1 Peter 4 says some very similar things to us regarding perspective. 1 Peter 4, 12 through 19. And I'll read it for us. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in so far as you share in Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed. Because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or a meddler. Yet, if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. But let him glorify God in that name. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous are scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. Amen. Similar to Hebrews, the first the book of 1 Peter was written in the context of Christian perseverance through suffering for their faith. And you'll ironically see in verse 12 that ridicule and affliction should be expected. I said the same thing in Hebrews. Ridicule and affliction should be expected. Verse 12, Peter tells them that their fiery trial... In their fiery trial, they should think two things. We should not be surprised that this is happening for our faith. 
And number two, we should not think this is strange or out of place for our faith. I'm going to say that again. As ridicule and affliction comes, Peter tells us we should not be surprised this is happening to our, by our faith, for our faith. And number two, we should not think this is strange or out of place. So what was their fiery trial? This may have been an allusion to the fact that Christians were blamed, put into prison, and killed for the massive fire that broke out in Rome in 64 AD. It was likely not official government persecution yet, but included insults, false accusations, mockery, social ostracism, and even anti-Christian mob violence. Sound similar to Hebrews? So how about us today, in 2021, our fiery trial? Well, whatever is going on, or will be going on, or may be happening for our faith, among our families, our culture in general, and even in public policies, we should not be surprised and not think something strange is happening. That doesn't mean it's easy, but don't be surprised. Secondly, 13 through 16, verses 13 through 16, our union with Christ sets the right perspective again, as in Hebrews. Peter reminds us that our union with Christ helps us to have the right perspective. And here he says four radical things. Number one, we should rejoice as we are sharing in the sufferings of Christ. Number two, we are blessed if we are insulted for the name of Christ. Number three, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of glory and of God rests upon us when this happens. And number four, we should not be ashamed for suffering for the name of Christ, but we should glorify God in that name. So let's take the first two here. These seem to be quite a paradox to us. A paradox is what? Two things set side by side where you don't know how the two fit together, but somehow they seem to be fitting together. What do they mean? Why are they a good thing? The first two were, we should rejoice as we are sharing in the sufferings of Christ. And number two was, we are blessed if we are insulted for the name of Christ. What do those mean? Why are they a good thing? Many cultures, let me take a crack at it here. Many cultures in the world are what we call honor-shame cultures. Here's a good example. The Japanese kamikaze pilots in World War II sacrificed themselves out of a deep sense of honor and death for country, right? It would be a shame on them and their families if they did not do all they could do for country. Honor and shame. Now, Peter, back in, in biblical times, biblical times were also an honor-shame culture. Peter plays on the values of honor and shame in connection with the sufferings of Christians. It was a great honor to suffer to follow Christ. One of the reasons why these verses seem to be hard for us to connect with is that the highest value in the United States is individual freedom. Now, with that said, we certainly do honor our military and our veterans, don't we? Ironically, one of the terms the apostles used for themselves and for Christians was being a soldier for Christ. So, if we can view ourselves as soldiers for Christ, living in a spiritual, cultural wartime, we too can start to rejoice in sharing the sufferings of Christ 
and see ourselves as blessed when we get insulted for the name of Christ. Does that help? I hope that helps. Jesus himself in Luke 6, 22 through 23 says this. Whew. Blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you and revile you and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy. For behold, your reward is great in heaven. For so their fathers did to the prophets. Wow. Times don't change. Two points. Not only that, Peter tells us that the spirit of glory rests upon us and that we should not be ashamed to bear the name of Jesus because we can glorify God in that name. The spirit of glory, what is that? Referring to the work of God in the fact that we will be raised up to glory soon, to heaven. That's our hope. Number two, glorify God. When we suffer insult for the name of Jesus... We are actually given an occasion to do what we were created and redeemed to do. That is, glorify and magnify God. Amazing. And third in this text, verses 17 and 18, 1 Peter 4, Peter goes on to tell us that God brings about testing to purify and strengthen our faith. Peter probably sees suffering as God's discipline for our good here. God sovereignly uses various types of suffering to purify and strengthen the church of Christ. Our salvation will come, but through trials. Contrast this to the judgment on those who will reject the gospel. They will surely receive the true judgment of God in them. So for us today, not only do we need to not be surprised when trials come upon us more and more as Christians, but we should also receive them as a tool God will use to purify and strengthen us. Now, is that a new perspective for the new year or what? And fourth and finally, verse 19 in 1 Peter 4, note three final points from Peter. Number one, we will suffer. But the suffering will be right in line with what the will of God is for us. Now, is that amazing or what? In the midst of, number two, in the midst of growing suffering, we need to entrust ourselves to God. That entrusting ourselves to God is a banking term, meaning for safe deposit. We need to entrust our souls to our good God in times of suffering and ridicule and trial. And then finally in verse 19, in the midst of growing suffering, we need to continue to do good in our church and on our communities. Continue to do what is right and good, even through your time of suffering and trial and ridicule, should it come or however it's going to come in the new year. Now, I think we all believe we are heading into more and more potentially anxious times, right? But I hope that these texts also make us feel like we are heading into, and dare I say it, exciting times too. Dare I say that? I don't mean to minimize the trials. I don't mean to minimize the fear or the anxiety or the, the uncertainty but I think these scriptures give us some encouragement that maybe through a new perspective for the new year, we can perceive these as 
spiritually exciting times for us. I say this based on the texts today, but also the testimony of the persecuted church throughout history. Persecution purifies and strengthens the church. Can be scary, but can be a very good thing for us too. C.S. Lewis, fa- Lewis famously said this, God whispers in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pain. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. Mm. Now, if there is anyone in this room today who does not really know Jesus personally yet, from my heart to yours, your primary thing to think about right now is to be made right with God first. No one can think the ways these texts are telling us to think unless you have been born again by the Spirit of God first. This is crazy talk or overly optimistic or something like that. If you have not come to know Jesus personally yet, you can't think like this. If you know deep down that you do not really know or believe Jesus yet, listen to me here. Here's what the Bible wants you to know first and foremost. This is the Bible talking here, not me. Number one, God made everything in the, God made everything in the world to work perfectly under his rule. Number two, sin ruined a perfectly working world. Sin is anything we think, feel, or do that disobeys God and his right and good rule over us. Sin is self-centered rebellion toward our maker. Number three, sin toward God comes naturally to us now. Each one of us is a sinner. Number four, sin deserves God's righteous punishment. Number five, Jesus came to save us from God's punishment and to restore our relationship with God. Six, we can receive forgiveness of our sin through confessing our sin to God and believing in Jesus alone for our salvation. How does Jesus save us? By two ways. Number one, living his life perfectly in our place. He did all the righteousness that God requires of us. Number two, he took upon God's punishment for our sin. So he did all the right and took care of all of our wrong. Believe. What does believe mean? Believe means that we can believe means that we understand and acknowledge these points. And number two, that we put our trust in them alone to make us right with God again. Number seven, when you place your faith in Jesus, God will now be working in you to restore how you were created to be, and you are promised eternal life in heaven. It doesn't end there. Point number eight. Finally, as more and more people experience reconciliation with God, God will be working through them to bring more and more reconciliation to the world so that it will eventually work perfectly again under God's rule. We're coming full circle. When you place your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you get to be a part of this epic story God is writing throughout history, and he's making everything right again. That's why it's called the good news. 
It's a divine rescue mission for all humanity. NBC deeply desires that you are made right with God. Through believing what I just told you, the Bible wants you to believe. So let me close making two quick points as we head into the new unknown of 2021. Two quick simple reminders here, hopefully. Number one, remember the scriptures. Always, every year, remember the scriptures. Scriptures like the ones that we just looked at today. Feed your soul on the living word. Remember, remember, remember. Because life as we leave this building, as we know, sometimes seems to go out of control. And we don't know what to believe, who to trust. What's tomorrow going to bring? Remember the scriptures. And number two, don't freak out. Live them out. We have a tendency to get a little freaked out by uncertainty, and understandably so, right? But if what we just talked about today is true, we can live at peace, an underlying peace that God is on the throne. And let's live them out. Let's be Christians. Let's be who we are. And I know a lot of us are in all different places of our spiritual maturity. Some of you are new in the faith and just, just get to know the word of God. Some of you have known the word of God for many, many years. Either way, be a Christian. Suffer for the name of Christ and be blessed. And I want to encourage you, just a little plug here, the Sunday Bible study is a great way for you to grow in the scriptures to help you not freak out, and to help you live them out in your family, in your workplace, in your neighborhood. So I want to encourage you to think about any of the Bible studies coming up this fall, I mean, uh, this uh, winter, New Year. Uh, feed on the Word of God. Be together as community. We're, I think we're going to need this more and more, right? As we see more and more uncertainty, we need one another and we need the Word. All right. Well, let's go to the Word and pray.